Hello, hello, wire ladies, women influencing real estate. I'm Betty Graham, and I am proud to say I am a Tom Ferry business coach. And uh, thank you, thank you very much for tuning in here today. And thank you to our wonderful founder, our wire founder, Debbie Holloway. Thank you so much, Debbie, for your hospitality inviting me to share my story here on Facebook Live. Now, so many of you may have faced far greater challenges than I have in my life. Still, I hope that something I say will resonate with you today and who knows, maybe light you on fire or make you realize that the power that I know that you have inside of you. You know, Tom, Tom, our wonderful Tom Ferry, talks about a life by design rather than a life by default. So I thought it would be fun if I shared with you the sort of influential D's of my life contributing to the relative success of, in our field of real estate sales. So like the wonderful country singer, Loretta Lynn, I too was born a coal miner's daughter. My daddy was a cotton farmer in Alabama where when money was short, he would leave for a few months and go to the nearby hills and work in the coal mines. He knew how to make ends meet, so the eight children my mama and he parented would not go too hungry. Well, watching my father's actions taught me my first lesson, D for discipline. It took a lot of discipline and devotion and darn hard work to feed those eight little mouths in our nest. With too many bad seasons in a row, they packed us up and they moved us to the promised land, which was the southeast corner of Missouri. You know, that section opposite the Ozarks, known as the Boot Hill. Now, below the Boot Hill, it meant that you were southern. So we were still southern. We weren't Midwestern. And we were poor. But we never gave that any thought. We never felt deprived. In Missouri, Daddy executed a 100-year lease on a 100-acre parcel of dirt. Now that piece of land was covered with dead tree stumps and thick brush, but he cleared that land and he plowed it into rows and he made himself a cotton farm. Now the land fronted on a gravel road called Route 2, and our farm was defined on each side by two drainage ditches. On one side was number eight ditch, on the other side was number nine ditch. Now number nine ditch was a dry ditch except when the Mississippi River overflowed. But number eight ditch, wow, it was always flowing, full of poisonous water moccasins and frogs and a few perch. Daddy built us a house on the ditch bank of number eight, right beside the bridge on Route 2. He was clever. One side of the house was on the bank, and the other was on stilts to accommodate the annually expected floods. Mama was an incredible role model, rising well before dawn to milk the cow while one of my five brothers slopped the hogs. Yes, I said slopped the hogs. Then she made our breakfast while we put on our overalls and got ready to go to the cotton fields. Our school quote-unquote vacation was timed for six weeks off for chopping cotton in the spring and six weeks off for picking cotton in the fall. Well, after milking the cow and making our breakfast, Mama made our lunch, which we called dinner, and brought it with her to the cotton field, a gallon jar of pinto beans, and always with a pan of warm cornbread. She left the field early to go home to make dinner, which we called supper, and still she picked more cotton than any other hand in the field. Do you ever wonder how some of our colleagues can sell hundreds of homes each year? You know, observing my mother taught me my second lesson, determination, it seemed to come easy to my mother. Nothing stopped her. If she had been a realtor, she probably had been like one of you, one of you powerhouses like Debbie or Peggy or Eileen, selling hundreds of homes every year. Now, the firstborn in our family was female. Nobody messed with Edna. And the lastborn was female our precious little baby sister, Carolyn, who we all thought was our own baby. I believe one of my mother's biggest challenges 
was raising a girl child in the midst of this five honking testosterone laden pups who loved to taunt me, make fun of me, and labeling me number of excuse me disrespectful names such as white elephant. <laughs> Wikipedia's definition. A white elephant, it says, is a possession which its owner cannot dispose of and is out of proportion to its usefulness. Another of their favorite descriptions of me, useless. I was also known as the landmark because the row in which we began the first thing in the morning was the row I'd probably still be on at lunchtime. Hence, they could look back to my location to know how many rows they'd covered by noon. The landmark. I wasn't made a farmer until I got into real estate. My brother's lives were far more interesting than mine. Mom will make them take me. I remember whimpering that a lot as they would hop in the car and take off to the picture show in the nearby town or to go swimming on a Sunday afternoon in the ditch or frog gigging on a hot summer night. They could go far off to pick berries or pick up walnuts while I had to stay home with mama and iron or churn butter. They could ride on top of the wagon to the cotton gin where men hung around and no woman was ever seen. They could throw their open knives into the damp ground and crack jokes that I wasn't supposed to hear because it was a girl, a mere female. I will slip in an extra little D here for a defining moment comes to my mind in my life. I was age seven, I remember, and I learned the importance of a high credit score. It was an early lesson in the life of a future real estate salesperson. I had gone with my mother to the grocery store where all the farmers bought their winter supplies on credit. And she was piling a few essentials on the counter, a bag of sugar, a sack of flour, some baking soda and so on. My head, I remember, just reached the countertop and I touched the pretty lavender flowers on the material of the flower sack. I knew my mama would soon make me a school dress with that sack. Seven dollars and sixty cents, Miss Teasley, the man behind the counter said. Charge it, Mr. Fawcett, she answered. He glanced around the store towards some other women picking out items and then he said it. Sorry, Miss Teasley. No more credit. She looked stunned. She looked stunned, her eyes filling with burning tears of shame. She placed her hand on my shoulder and she turned me towards that front door. It was the first time I had seen my mother cry. So much for the new dress. <laughs> Weather was no kinder in Missouri than in Alabama. The cycle often repeated itself. Save money to buy seeds, plant them. Too much rain rotted the seeds. Borrow money from the bank to replant. Then as the seedlings sprouted, the sun drought came and would burn them and stunt their growth and make for another lousy cotton crop. If you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. Right? How many times have our Mentors and managers and coaches reminded us of that. Or as Tom said at the summit last week, what got you here won't get you there, right? After 10 years of too hot, too cold, too wet, too dry, we sold out. That's what I wrote in my diary that day. Today we sold out. Piled everything we could on top of our car and strapped it down and drove to California to the fair town of Lost Hills, 350 people in the San Joaquin Valley. If John Steinbeck could, so could we. So I'll choose duplicate for my next lesson. Yes, like grapes of wrath, we moved to a migrant workers camp. We were still poor, but we still gave it no thought. We had parents who knew how not only to survive, but to thrive in that dusty little town out there in the middle of the desert between Bakersfield and the Pacific Coast. Daddy got a job operating a gigantic tractor in the nearby gypsum pit. And he bought a house in that funky little dirtbag village on Highway 46. A year or so later, he sold that house 
and bought a nice home in the nearby town of Owasco, where we were bused from Lost Hills to school. At age 17, I married Wasco Tigers quarterback hero, Kobe Preston. After all, you could not have sex if you weren't married, right? My senior year in high school, I was the only married student. It was embarrassing to me because I felt the vibe that all the students knew I had done it. My husband had graduated a year ahead of me. He leased a service station back in Lost Hills and I moved there, back there, and rode the bus again to finish high school in Wasco. Summer came, and I and my little Levi cutoffs was pumping gas and wiping windshields for the handsome soldiers stopping on their way from Fort Ord to the mysterious to city to the south. Mysterious city to the south, Los Angeles. On Saturday nights, I would listen to Lucky Logger dance time on the radio, and wonder what it must be like in Los Angeles. Bewildered by our new status, and now at ages 18 and 19 after a frustrated Kobe socked me a few times, I used his temper as an excuse to get the heck out of Dodge. I ran away in the middle of the night. I took the Greyhound bus to LA with my cousin Jeannie's address scrawled on a crumpled piece of paper in my pocket. At dawn, when that bus rolled into downtown Los Angeles, I handed that bit of paper to the bus driver. Do you know where this is? I asked him. He squinted at the paper and pointed to a line of cars. See that row of yellow cars? He said, take it to the one in front. He'll take you there. Well, Jeannie wasn't expecting me and she didn't have a telephone. I can't believe the innocence of the era. I rang her bell on the triplex and when she didn't answer, I rang the bell marked manager. <laughs> he actually let me into her apartment and I fell asleep on top of her bed and waited for her to come home. I had never been to a city, but I had been taught shorthand and typing and English was my favorite subject. So divorce and decisions were my fourth and fifth Ds. Divorce and decisions. I immediately found a job as a floating secretary at CBS TV City. My first assignment was to assist a comedian with a local CBS variety show, a young man named Johnny Carson. I was 18, he was 28. When he was promoted to host a national TV show in New York City, he offered me the job as his personal assistant. I accepted the position, but in the end, I instead decided to stay in LA. Mr. Carson was irritated with me, but we remained friends until he left this planet a few years ago. At CBS and subsequent other production companies, I moved through a number of television shows, including The Twilight Zone and Batman, where I was assistant casting director. Along the way, at age 27, I met an artistic art, I'm sorry to say, I met an attractive artistic television director, William A. Graham. A Yale graduate, the son of a Wall Street lawyer, Billy lived on his 35-foot yacht in Marina del Rey, California. He rode his motorcycle to the studios. After dating a couple of years, we decided to be married, and at age 30, I gave birth to my only child, Charles Vanderveer Graham. Being married to Billy was great fun. We shot films all over the United States, Manhattan, Hawaii, San Francisco, as well as Rome and Mexico and Paris and Spain and London and Scotland and so on. And we sailed that 35 foot boat up and down the Pacific coast, including from San Pedro across the Pacific to Hilo, Hawaii. <laughs> Taking care of my baby and going to journalism school I learned to be a relatively good photographer, and I loved writing for the college newspaper. Having always worked, I was uncomfortable being, quote, just a housewife. The camera allowed me to have a function on the set as the still photographer on Billy's shoots. But it was the roaring 60s, and after 10 years, I decided on divorce again. Billy and I raised our son in Malibu, in separate homes, 
on friendly turf. At age 40, in April 1976, I received my license to sell California real estate. It was a popular sport for newly divorced wives then. Because of our entertainment business connections and because I lived and understood Malibu Marketplace and because I absolutely loved being in real estate, I attracted a number of celebrity clients. Early in my career, I represented either the buyer or the seller for Rod Steiger, Charles Bronson, Cicely Tyson, Cleavon Little, LeVar Burton, and a number of heads of studios and producers and directors. With other two other women, we founded a small boutique real estate company in Malibu and Topanga Canyon. We called it Coast and Canyon. <laughs> Active in California Association of Realtor Activities, I met John Douglas, who was a dazzling figure in Beverly Hills luxury real estate. John Douglas recruited me to leave my own company and join his powerful regional luxury brand and eventually manage his Malibu location. It was one of the best decisions I ever made. My career soared after I moved to his established company, high end, known for the highest level of integrity. Getting listings there was much easier. The Malibu Board of Realtors asked me to be president and John Douglas urged me to step up to the challenge. I was afraid to because of my fear of public speaking. So I took a UCLA speech class, which helped me a lot. But what really helped me even more was when I described my anxiety to Johnny Carson, he gave me some good advice. He said, you don't make a speech, don't make a speech. Just stand up and talk to him. <laughs> Johnny and I had remained good friends over the years and he was supportive of my real estate career. He loved calling me Madam President when I accepted the board task, and he trusted me with a listing on his Malibu Beach home, which we sold to John McEnroe. Which leads me to my sixth D, discretion. In the entertainment field, a high value is placed on discretion, on confidentiality and relationship. An LA Times hot property columnist called asked me to be her contact for celebrity news in Malibu. Absolutely not. My reaction was immediate. Well, she continued, I'm asking because I understand you have a deal pending with Johnny Carson and John McEnroe and that the contract contains a particular clause. Please, please, Ruth, I beg, don't print that without my getting the client's approval. She then told me she had learned of it because Mr. McEnroe had disclosed it to a sports writer in Paris and it had already been published in French. <laughs> I did call my client and he surprised me by saying, use it. I think it's a cute story. The clause in the purchase agreement provided for Mr. McEnroe to give Mr. Carson six private tennis lessons or he would not sell him the home. But had I not made that call, do you think Mr. Carson would have been ticked off? He would have been. In my late forties, I met another artist a talented record producer, a New York-born Sicilian, Tom Catalano. Tom had tremendous success, particularly with early Neil Diamond producing Hot August Night, including Sweet Caroline, Song Song Blue, Crackling Rosie, and so on. The best man at our wedding was Madonna's personal manager, Freddie DeMann, and I was introduced to help Madonna locate a honeymoon home for Sean Penn and her. She liked the first home I showed her, and the next morning she wanted Sean to see it. I met them at the property and they drove up in his pickup truck with Madonna scooted right up against him behind the steering wheel. It reminded me of my teenage dating days on the farm. And again, discretion was critical. Tom Catalano had retired from the music industry and wasn't really comfortable living in this entertainment mecca of Los Angeles. So we moved to San Francisco and I opened John Douglas company there. My husband didn't appreciate playing second fiddle to the work I loved so much and we parted. When his top manager retired, 
John Douglas asked me to return to L.A. and manage his flagship office in Beverly Hills. Well, I'd been a good manager for John Douglas in Malibu. I built his presence there, or we did, from 12 agents to 85 agents in two locations. But Beverly Hills, I was awed and intimidated by that challenge. The daring, daring is my seventh D. Mama, make them take me. What I learned in this stage was the power of gratitude and admiration for the work of a realtor. My belief in John Douglas Company was immense. I believed our agents were the best. They lived and operated at a higher standard, ethically, professionally. They were dressed better. They were kind and knowledgeable. The competition began to notice, and they wanted to be a part of our culture. I was sometimes referred to as Agent Whisperer. <laughs> I was sometimes referred to as tough. I was sometimes referred to as the soul of the company, and I was also referred to as an iron fist wrapped in a velvet glove. <laughs> but with the art of delegation, you know, I had five associate managers in that office of 175 great agents. We built that office to be the top producing office in the international system. Every year for 12 years, I was honored to be the manager. Along the way, John Douglas had sold his company to an international brand, but nothing changed except the name on the front door. Although I had a little, quote, drunk monkey denigrating self-talk, white elephant, landmark, useless, <clears throat> I dared to recruit a number of high flyers because I was such a believer in the value of the firm. Have you noticed that when you believe in your value, your career grows, it expands, doesn't it? After 12 years of receiving office awards in behalf of our agents' efforts, the East Coast boss asked me to be president of their Greater Los Angeles presence. I was stunned. I caught my breath out loud in the middle of the restaurant when they asked me to wear that hat. I actually gasped. <laughs> what would those five brothers think of this? I told the home office I'd think about it. I wasn't sure I could add value. Plus, I felt I had the best job in real estate managing the top producing office in the country. Think of it. To go from managing one office producing over a billion and a half dollars annually in sales volume to being president of a real estate firm of 30 offices. But ultimately, like you, I am a salesperson and good salespeople love to be challenged, don't we? So the next seven years I was president and chief operating officer of the Greater Los Angeles Company, steering the 3,500 sales staff from Santa Barbara through Palm Springs. I could hardly wait to tell my brothers I had a fancy new title. <laughs> I could hardly wait every year at our family reunion to show them the LA Business Journal in gray glass bowls awarded my company, our company, year after year as the top real estate firm in Los Angeles. And then sure enough, because my focus was often on the luxury arm of the company, corporate asked me to take a a national position for the company and be president of the luxury division. I traveled all over the United States in Paris and Rome and Barcelona, addressing groups of agents and executives and managers on the best practices of our 84,000 sales associates in 47 countries. I could not believe it was I standing up there. Some days I felt it was a fraud you know, inadequate education, a damaged pedigree, doubting my ability to deliver. I often fell back on the many times my five brothers dared me when my, bro when my mother wasn't looking. Quote, jump into number eight ditch, Betty Jean, and there I was in the middle of the water moccasins reacting with defiance instead of good sense. So yeah, defiance might be my last deed. Or maybe it's deficiency. But I can tell you this without equivocation. I am de-driven to overcome my perceived deficiencies. Three years ago, 
after retiring from my career, God gave me another chance at happiness when I met a wonderful man, a financial advisor named Bud Myers. We were married in April, about three months ago. We live in Century City, where I laugh and learn new things from him every day. When I decided retirement made me feel irrelevant in the world, I spoke to Tom Ferry about starting my own luxury real estate coaching business. For many years, Tom and I had worked hand in glove to make our agents better. Well, Tom is the ultimate influencer, so I was easily swayed. And instead of developing my own company, I happily have become a Tom Ferry coach. I don't know why I was able to leapfrog the usual discriminations. I was offered many opportunities as a female in a male-dominated world. And now the possibility of age discrimination, it's eluding me too. As I wrote my little talk for Wire, Tom Ferry's message of mindset being the culprit or the victor kept springing before me. And I'm so eager to help all of my Tom Ferry clients and you to realize you are invincible if you choose to be, if you are willing to stretch that 40% further. Your career can explode with victory. So wrapping up my D's influence, I discreetly decided divorcing from my deficiencies that with discipline, determination, daring, and defiance, I am driven to be a dynamite coach. And I have my brothers to thank for that. <laughs> and I thank you. I thank you very much for listening. Let me get off of here.